I was driving through a community one time and came to this T road and this picture I took looking out my windshield. So I was, I looked to the left, looked to the right. There was no cars parked. So I, I didn't know which way to go because this sign was being blocked by the shrub. <clears throat> the point of this is, um, you need a reason to prune and one very good reason to prune is public safety. Um, here the plant is blocking the signage which is giving direction which can influence safety if I was to go the wrong way down a one-way road because I couldn't see the arrow and it's pointing. But it's also a reminder that there can be more than one way to do pruning. You may have learned to do a pruning method on a particular plant one way and I'm going to hear it or I'm going to explain it a different way and then we might encounter a third person who's going to want to do it their own way as well. There's no right or wrong way to prune a plant. I think there's just some better ways to do it than others and we're going to focus on some of the basic methods today. There's no way I can teach you how to prune everything out there but if I can teach you the appropriate pruning methods then when you encounter a plant you can look up some information about it and if it tells you to prune by thinning it in the late dormant season you will know what to do. Some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about today um, definitely the three-point pruning cut. This is the standard Master Gardener test exam and probably the hardest cut that you need to master out there and it's not really hard at all. We're going to talk about heading back, thinning, deadheading, shearing, and renewal, and essentially those are all things you do to shrubs. Trees, you do a three-point pruning cut. We will talk mostly in terms of deciduous trees, we will talk about deciduous shrubs, and we'll end with a quick conversation about conifers, both tree and shrub forms. Through the course of this presentation, I may make comments regarding to hard pruning and light pruning. And I don't know where these terms came from for me, but they emerged in my vocabulary at some point. And when I go to try to look them up, I can't really find good definitions, but I continue to use them. So I will define them now. When I say hard pruning, I am talking about going out to a plant and removing a quarter or more of it in the late dormant season. So 25% or more of the plant is being removed in the late dormant season, February, March, early April. When I talk about light pruning, I'm referring to us removing 10% or less and the plant's actively growing. So hard pruning, we're, we're removing a lot when it's dormant. Light pruning, we're removing a little while it's growing. And I'll work that in um, a little bit here, a little bit there as we go out, as I talk about how we're going to prune different things. Quick biology overview. Woody plants have two types of growth. There's the primary growth, which is occurring at the tips. This is what's making the branches longer, the tree taller, and what we see as a result of this are the nodes, and most importantly, the internodes, the space between them. As branches get thicker and wider, this is what's called secondary growth. This is occurring at the cambium, the layer of growing tissue under the bark. On the outside it produces phloem, but on the inside it produces xylem, which each year it produces a new xylem ring that, that gives our woody plants the girth. So if we were to zoom in on the insides of a tree, the cambium layer is just this thin sheath that's covering the entire tree, like if you put your foot into a sock and how the sock covers you, covers your foot, um, the cambium layer is very similar to that. But on the outside, it's producing the phloem, and outside of that's the bark. But inside of that is the xylem. And in a tree, water is conducted in the outermost ring of the xylem. So the newest ring on the outside moves the water up and down. And sugars are then moved in the phloem. All the old xylem, though, remains in the tree, and it has various functions. Um, again, water's only moving up and down in the outermost, newest ring, 
but then there's a collection of probably 10 to 12 rings that we call the sapwood and those rings are used for storage of some of the sugars so we have what are called ray cells which are basically xylem cells turned on their side that are running in and out of the phloem and they are going to carry some of the sugars that are being moved up and down and they'll store it in the sapwood further into the tree we encounter what's known as the heartwood and this is old xylem tissue old sapwood tissue that is now no longer functional in storage or water movement but it's there just for structural support as a take-home message if this is the trunk of the tree just remember each year it grows a new ring of xylem Things get a little convoluted when the branches come out of the sides of the tree because what we're looking at are layers of branch tissue and trunk tissue, branch tissue and trunk tissue, branch tissue and trunk tissue that are layered on top of each other. They're actually separate tissues. They have their own diff their, um, different water conducting tissues that meet further into the tree, but for support and function, they are separate as that branch protrudes out of the the tree. Think of it as your arm coming out of your sleeve. You know, if you had a short sleeve shirt or a long sleeve shirt and crunch your sleeve up and you hold it out to the side, think of your shirt as the trunk tissue and your arm coming out as the branch and how your shirt sleeve wraps around it. That's the way the trunk tissue wraps around the branch as it comes out. And we call the sleeve, most often we call it the collar, but it's going to be that area at a branch that you can see as a swelling where the union of the branch tissue and trunk tissue come together. And if you look on most species, you're going to see where the two tissues press up against one another. And it's kind of like plate tectonics that make mountain ranges. You know, these two pieces of land come together, make a mountain range. Well, think of this as a little mini mountain range that's causing the, the branch bark ridge. And that's from the trunk tissue pressing up against the branch tissue. Do a quick cross section of a branch and you can see how there's the trunk tissue and it's ending right along there because that's where the branch is. And we can see how the branch comes into the tree and you know a long time ago it started off as a lateral bud on a twig and it started to grow to the side and all this other wood grew up around it through the secondary growth. Now this is where that compartmentalization comes into. So trees respond to injury and in a nutshell we don't say they heal they seal trees do not heal they seal up the wounds that they encounter and it's called the compartmentalization of decay in trees and i'm going to do my best to explain it to you it consists of a series of barriers that can form in the xylem and these barriers will keep disease or decay from spreading through the tree. So first of all, let's talk about barrier one. Barrier one are the plugs that will form to keep pathogens from moving up and down a tree in the water conducting tissue of the xylem. So barrier one will keep things from moving up and down the tree in that single pipe. In many trees it's effective, but for the most part we think of it as a weak barrier that is often broken and disease can, or decay can move up and down. The next barrier is barrier two, and barrier two is what's keeping the decay or disease from moving into the tree. So the difference between the growth rings that you would see, that's keeping the that's slowing the movement of decay into the center of the tree. Again, it's kind of weak too. We don't get too excited about that one. Where we start to see strength is with the ray cells that form a barrier to keep things from moving laterally or around the tree. So here we see where a ray cell, which normally would be moving sugars from the phloem into the sapwood, it is preventing some of the lateral movement of decay 
in this tree. And in this case, it's forming this little pie wedge because of the way the tree's been cut. So one keeps things from moving up and down. Two slows the spread inward. Three slows the spread sideways. The most important barrier and the strongest of them is barrier four. And barrier four is the difference of this year's wood and next year's wood. So barrier four is what's keeping decay and disease from spreading into the wood that grows over the wound, over the decay, over the rot. And it will cover it up. Um, there's chemicals and some physical um, differences in the tissues that really, really make this a strong barrier that keeps decay from spreading outward. So real quickly, one is keeping things from going up and down, two prevents it from going in, barrier three keeps it from going sideways, but barrier four, which is the most important one, keeps it from going outward into the new growth. So let me show you how this works going back to my little diagram here. So here's our trunk, and we hit it with a lawnmower, let's say. So we've done some damage at the base of it. We have a large wound, and we're now afraid decay is going to get in. Well, let's not do anything about it. Let's watch how, it, how the tree responds. So growth is going to continue, and each year it's going to grow a little bit more and a little bit more, and that wound's going to get covered up a little bit more each time until eventually it's going to get to the point where the tree has sealed it over and it has grown completely around that wound compartmentalizing it and now we're not seeing it anymore but did it heal no because that damage is still present on the trunk that was um, hit with the lawnmower and until this is healed over that decay can continue to spread through that area and what we want to do is have trees heal over before all this decay um, spreads throughout. But this is interesting because this is what makes trees hollow. All this new growth can form on the outside of the tree and it could be sound, it could be clean, and it could be, de be decay free, but that decay is going to be limited to the trunk that was present at the time the wound was made. Well, we use that information to make proper pruning cuts. Knowing how trees respond with their growth we want to make a pruning cut that will seal over a wound and limit the spread of decay. So here we're looking at another cross section of the tree. And let's just look at it. Here's the branch that's coming in. What we want to do is make a pruning cut right there at the collar. So we're removing the branch tissue, but without damaging the trunk tissue. Because the trunk tissue is what's going to heal it over. And the end result would be something like this, where here we can see where the branch was present, but how trunk tissue has now sealed it over, compartmentalizing the decay only into the small little branch area that we see here. Now to do a proper pruning cut, it is best to do what we call the three-point pruning cut method. Um, there's a lot of advantages to this. One, it's going to set you up to make a nice clean cut at the branch collar. But two, it's going to prevent extra injury to the tree in case the branch was to break. Because if we were to go up to this tree and just start hacking out here on the end of the branch, cutting downward, cutting downward, there's still a lot of branch hanging out over the side. And it could be covered with leaves, maybe, maybe not. And gravity is going to be pulling down on it. And as we cut down further and further, that branch is going to be pulled down and finally it's going to snap, stripping bark off down the side of the tree. And that's going to be a large, regularly shaped wound. And we don't want to have those in the tree. Those are doorways for decay to get in. So what we want to do is focus on removing the weight of that branch, protecting ourselves from any kind of bark stripping, and then come in with a nice clean cut right along the branch collar. So to do this, we do cut A, which is First, identify the collar and come out about six inches or so, and using a saw, cut upwards a quarter to halfway through the branch, and then stop. And then using the same saw, come outside that and from the top down, remove the weight of the branch with cut B. So cut A, 
is going to keep things from stripping back on you as you're making cut B. So as soon as you get down to about even, or maybe you have to go all the way through, the branch is going to fall, and if any bark is stripped, this cut's going to keep it from going down into the trunk of the tree. So now that the weight of the branch is removed, you can use your hand, have a handle to hold on to here, hold on to the stub, and make your nice precise cut right along the branch collar, being careful to remove only the branch tissue without damaging any of the trunk tissue along the collar. So let's just take a look at this animation. First of all, we're going to have the branch in place, and we want to make cut A, and then cut B to remove the weight of the branch. And then holding on that stub, come in right at the collar to make cut C to remove the branch. Now if you're going to err, one of the ways you do it is by cutting too much off. If you were to get down into the collar and cut that off, that's what's called a flush cut. And in doing so, you're getting into the actual trunk tissue, damaging that, and making a very large wound that needs to heal over. So let's look at these cross sections. Here we're seeing first a proper cut in which there's the branch. And we see how by making that nice small cut at the branch collar, we already have growth starting to heal over. And in a year or two, this is going to be sealed up and decay is going to be just limited to the spot. Unfortunately, with this other photo, the cut was made through the collar. The sleeve was cut completely off. And now we have a doorway for decay to get in, not only into the branch, but up into this trunk tissue as well. So we're going to have increased amounts of decay and longer time for healing for sealing of this wound. Just another example, if this was the cut made, this would be the flush cut in which we are removing a little triangle of trunk tissue here and this finger of trunk tissue there, making a very large wound that's going to take a long time for this tree to heal over. The proper cut is the smaller cut, occurring right here at the collar, removing only the branch tissue, leaving the trunk tissue in place. Another big mistake is leaving too much of the branch on, and this is what we call a stub cut. This is where you leave the handles. And at first, this can be corrected. You can come in and make nice cuts along these and correct it. But if left on too long, these start to rot and decay. And then you wind up with, once again, large decay pockets in your tree as the trunk attempts to heal that over. So just for a quick example, here is when cut A is not made. And we start to see how the bark is stripped down the side when the branch removes. Again, this is preventable with cut A. It keeps the bark from stripping back on itself. And here's just a more extreme example. Whenever you have bark stripping off, this is doorways for decay to get in. And the more regularly shaped it is, the harder it is for the tree to seal it over. Now, whenever you do make a cut on the tree, keep in mind it is a doorway for decay to get in. You don't want to paint it over. In fact, there's very few cases where we do want to use pruning paint. We'll get to those in a few slides. What I'd rather you focus on is when it is time to prune, make sure you make the proper pruning cut and you make the smallest pruning cut possible. For the vast majority of master gardeners out there, my recommendation for you is don't, to cut, don't cut branches off larger than your arm or your wrist. In doing so, you are removing probably a piece of tissue that's too large to be removed at the time, but also from your point of view, it may be too big for you to handle physically. If you start to get to pruning things that are, are larger than that, that's when you might need to consider calling a professional in to assist you. So why prune? You need a reason to prune, and, and here's three good ones. One, you need to prune for the future health of the tree. A properly pruned plant's gonna live longer in the environment. We're also pruning for safety. 
public safety is a big thing. We don't want a tree to fall on our house or on our car or on a passerby. And this does come into play with how you prune it, but also the right plant for the right place. Make sure you have something with the right strength of wood, the right uh, form, um, just the right characteristics for the location you're putting in. And finally, we're pruning for aesthetics. And this is probably why most of you came to this class anyways, to try to prune so things look better. Some plants will flower more it, when properly pruned. Some plants will fruit more if properly pruned. Some plants just look better if they have some natural, sh some shape pruned into them. So these are some just easy reasons, future health, safety, and aesthetics. So when to prune? Well, I've already said the late dormant season is the best for most pruning. You're gonna hear some exceptions, but for most of the big work that needs to be done, Doing their pruning in February, March, early April is fine. Um, I like to say Valentine's Day to Tax Day is a good time for pruning. Why is that? Well, first of all, the wounds that you're going to make on the plants are going to be exposed to the environment for a short time before healing begins. I've actually done some pruning cuts in November and have come out and revisited them the following spring and have found them to be all dried and cracked because of the dry winter winds. When you prune in that February, March period, they're not going to be exposed to the cold and the dryness for as long. Um, and so when it comes time to heal over and in a few weeks, there's a smooth surface that's better to heal over. So that's one reason. It's going to be easier to make pruning decisions without, without all those leaves getting in your way. You're going to be able to get in and assess the tree for its actual architecture and structure without having all the foliage block your view. This way you can look for double leaders, uh, tight crotches, uh, bad uh, branch unions, and get those removed. Finally, you're going to avoid diseases and some insect problems by getting your pruning done early. By pruning in the late dormant season, you're not going to have bugs flying, and you're not going to have them be vectors for disease. So get that pruning done now, and then the wound's going to be healed over enough to not be attracted to, um, to not attract sap feeding insects. Also from the point of view, um, consider the plant's physiology. We've talked about how those tissues store sugars. And if we look at this graph, in January, those tissues are just full of sugar. So all the energy that plant needs is stored. And if we watch how this curve changes over the course of the year, we start to see that as spring starts to come, that plant starts to utilize these sugars to make that first flush of leaves that we see. And then by May and June, the plant has all these leaves that have now formed from pre last year's sugars, and they start to do photosynthesis, start to make sugars, and start to replenish that fuel tank of the sapwood until leaf drop in the fall. And so this is a normal curve that, you know, this can be highly getting to be stressful on the tree because it's used its sugars, but then it quickly rebounds. Now let's think about this. If we're going to prune, if we came in and started pruning in the spring, and we cut off all these leaves, we have just removed this investment of sugars and energy that the plant has made for the following year. So we have actually put some stress on the plant if we do our pruning while it's in full leaf because we're removing its ability to recoup the sugars that it invested into it. And that's gonna cause this curve then to not replenish and not be as high. And in one year, that is fine. But what I see being the problem is people who go out year after year after year and are pruning at the full leaf stage, they're just stressing the tree out. By pruning when it's dormant, it's got this investment made, but then when it starts to invest those sugars into leaves, we're not taking it away. It's able to recoup it. So anyways, pruning in the late dormant season, better from the physiological point of view of the plant. Some other things to note when pruning. Oak wilt, and we can talk about Dutch elm disease at the same time here. Those are both diseases spread by insects. And these are insects that are attracted to the sap of trees. If there are pruning wounds on the either of these trees while those beetles are flying, 
they will come to it and infect the trees. So this is why we say do not prune your oaks or elms April 15th through June. And we're even more conservative to say don't prune them April 15th through October. No, only do the pruning on those in that late dormant season when there are no bugs flying and the wounds heal in plenty of time before those insects start flying in the air. Spring and summer pruning can increase the chance of the bacterial disease fire blight on things like apple and crab apple and hawthorns and anything else in the rosaceous family. This is a bacteria that can almost make can you know appear like overnight, get into the wounds of um, these trees and make it look like they caught on fire. It's pretty extreme. So avoid those uh, spring and summer pruning. Um, to cut back on those diseases. Again, do that late dormant season pruning so those wounds are healed in time. Remember that there are some plants that no matter what you do, prune them or just look at them cross-eyed, they are going to ooze sap and we call them the bleeders. And they're going to have sap just ooze from the wounds, they might get yeast or bacteria in them and they're going to turn all sorts of funny colors. This is nothing to worry about. Very common in their plants and um, don't do anything about it. Let's talk a little bit about pruning paint though. You don't want to use pruning paint only, now let me rephrase that, you only want to use pruning paint in certain conditions and that is on an oak or an elm that needs to be pruned during the growing season. So it's say July and there's a windstorm that comes through and breaks a branch off your oak and elm. You want to get in there and make a good pruning cut so it can heal over, but then you'd want to paint it at this time to keep the insects from getting into it. At other times, like with these maples and birches, you don't want to bother putting paint on those because this bleeding is a natural thing and any kind of wound that's on them is just going to be slowed down in the healing process. So leave them open to the air to heal. So a quick recap, we got the three point pruning method, which consists of that undercut, cut A, B and then C which removes the branch completely and usually when you're using this it's best done in the late dormant season because you're removing a large branch of the tree a significant portion of the plant. So let's go into those other techniques first there's heading back and this is when you have a shrub that is or a tree that has overgrown and what you do is you trace the branch back to a place where it meets another one and you remove it at that point and this is a heading back to a lateral branch. So here there used to be another branch coming off here that was removed so this side branch takes over and directs growth. If you're removing a lot of them wait and do it in the dormant season but if there's just some branches in your way while mowing um, you can do that any time of year. So just as an example with this burning bush here's one that has grown too large. One of the things you can do to correct it is come in and do some heading back cuts, thin it out, um, reduce the size, open it up some, allow some more light to get through. Heading back would be an appropriate method of pruning this shrub. Thinning is useful when you have suckering shrubs, something like common lilac or in this picture here, um, red twig dogwood. And coming in with either a saw or maybe some loppers, get down into the base of the plant and remove the largest branches you encounter. So you can remove up to one third of the stems, um, go for the largest and oldest, and again best done in the late dormant season. Which that's how I prune lilacs, and this is where we could have a large conversation because each of us would probably want to prune lilacs differently. I like to go in and remove just one third of the largest branches, and that doesn't do anything for the flowering it leaves flowering alone because on all these branches that I have left alone there's still flower buds. So by just thinning it I can still have good flowers on my lilac remembering that they bloom on wood from last year. Now if I went in and sheared it all off which I'll talk about very soon um, then I am cutting the flower buds off. So here's another lilac very overgrown um, one of those beautiful farm lilacs um, it could be really rejuvenated if we were to come in here and start to thin these out and get new growth. Deadheading, here's my joke slide. This is when you head back um, 
you're doing a heading back cut, but what you're doing is you're cutting back to a bud and you're removing a spent inflorescence or flower. This is very commonly done on lilacs again, um, because what we want to do is remove those seed heads because there can be an aesthetic issue with them. Maybe you don't want to look at them all summer. But in order to do that, you want to do that within two weeks of the flower fade. So once you start to see that flower go past its prime, you want to cut them off to a lateral bud, and then it will set a new flower bud for next year. If you wait too long and you do that cut, you, have, you may inadvertently remove the flower bud, and you won't have flowers the following year. So plants that, that may work on, plants that bloom on wood from the previous season, um, which typically are spring blooming woody ornamentals. So we're talking lilacs, we're talking forsythia, we're talking bridal wreath spirea, many others. So again, here are the faded flowers. They, these are actually going to seed for a lilac tree. I would want to come in back to about maybe here and prune that off within two weeks of that fading so I can get flowers for next year. Now shearing is when you just kind of go through and remove the most vigorous shoots that you encounter on the plant. This really can shape the plant. We see where you can come in with a pair of uh, shears via electric or manual and you're just nipping off those most vigorous shoots. And this is where we can really sculpt a shrub into shape. Keep in mind that when you are cutting at the same point year after year after year after year, you may inadvertently develop what we call a shell. And this is going to be a really dense layer of tissue that may prevent light from getting down into the plant below. And that may cause, this might cause it to be thin and leggy. So my recommendation on occasion when this happens is, is just go back a little bit beyond it and start to thin those out. Maybe you're doing heading back cuts. And this will just help the life and longevity and the appearance of some of these deciduous shrubs you may have in your landscape. With our evergreen shrubs, that may not be so much a case. So what I like about taxis or yews is they're, they're color coded for pruning. You can come in with your shears and cut off all the light green stuff and be fine. You can begin doing this when the growing season spring hits. So we're talking May, June, July. You could probably do this two to three times a year to keep these plants in, in shape. When shearing, though, be careful of the shapes you give the shrub, the silhouettes that you see. When you inadvertently get something wider at top and narrower at the base, this can cause some aesthetic issues. Um, the top part will start to act as an umbrella and shade out the lower part. And if there's not enough light getting to the lower part, it's going to lose its leaves. So rather than having a nice thick shrub, you're going to wind up with something that's going to look more like a table. So avoid wider at the top. What you want to do is have it narrow at the top and wider at the base. And this way, light's going to be more likely to get all the way down and you'll have a fuller, healthier looking shrub. So another pruning technique is called renewal pruning, and this works well for Japanese spirea. Those are the chartreuse leafed shrubs with the pink flowers, or purple with pink flowers. Um, you see them in many parking lots across the state. This is where you can basically come in and you flat top the shrub to about half or one third its height, and then you just come in and break out the largest stems. This, this is a very vigorous type of pruning and um, actually works well on many things other than Japanese spirea. I've done it to some honeysuckle. I've, I've done it to a lot of shrubs, many times at the price of flowers for a year. Um, over here in this picture, this is bridal wreath spirea, and there's been times where I've encountered very old, very leggy um, shrubs like this that, that really need to be rejuvenated or, or renewed, and I will sacrifice flowers and, and cut them all back and have a year of good green growth followed by a year of flowers and then I'll get into a thinning cycle with them just just to get back on with with my life and get them useful in the landscape. Here's the Japanese spirea which has been sheared down to little meatballs. Here's a barberry that's been sheared to meatballs. Here's a yew that's been sheared. I mean we can do all sorts of pruning methods to, to these plants.
I want to jump to trees, though, just for a minute, because there's something that can be done to them which is very bad. And this is called topping. And this is where we have a tree, and for some reason we're concerned that it's gotten too large, and we usually pay someone uh, to come in and just kind of cut off all those branches. And, oh, that can cause problems. Let's look at those problems. First of all, when you just cut off the growing point, you're releasing the plant from apical dominance. That is, you remove that growing point, and all those lateral buds break and start growing. And so we have a plant now that that has these long branches with these brooms at the end. And that can start to get heavy as all this growth occurs and all these leaves start to form on them. But also because of the way that cut was made across the trunk, it can't heal over. The cambium is growing sideways, laterally, for secondary growth. However, it can't heal over this way. So what we're now left with is a decay column that is forming in the tree. So on the ends of those branches where the cut was made, it starts to rot going down the branches. And at the same time, we have all this hard or succulent heavy growth going out the side. So what we're doing is we're setting ourselves for even a worse disaster than if we would have had the tree left alone. So don't top trees. There's actually big campaigns in our state to prevent people from doing it. Now when pruning, look at the natural shape of the tree. Work within that shape. Do not try to force that triangular tree to be a circular tree, or don't try to force that columnar tree to be a weeping tree. Work with the natural shape. There are limitations. Look at the location which the tree is growing. Trees in different areas can be allowed to do different things. For example, in the UW Arboretum, they're purposely not pruned just to see what the shape the canopy will take. You may not want to do that in your urban area because we do have traffic, we do have public safety we need to consider. And we need to get trees canopy so they're high enough so we can get clearance by vehicles. Um, need to make sure they're pruned so nothing falls on your house, etc. You know, it's when you get to downtown areas, boy, now we're having to prune not only for public safety and clearance, but we also now need to prune for signage to be visible and for pedestrians to get through and to minimize vandalism. Um, the pruning requirements in a downtown area are even so much higher than even in your suburb or home landscape. So this is the list that I encourage people to follow when it comes time to prune a plant. Um, this is definitely applicable to uh, trees meant to be large shade trees. I, I do recognize, however, that we do have some specialty trees out there, some fruit trees, that some of these don't apply, and, and I'll, I'll tell you where to fudge on those. Um, but trees meant to be large shade trees, they, they have a lot of value in our landscape, um, they, they should have this pruning done to them manually. So first of all, when you approach your tree, your priority is to remove broken, diseased, dying, or dead branches. Get them out. Clean up the canopy. Remove those right away. Then you want to select the leader and remove competing leaders. So a leader is going to be the central growing point in the tree that's going to give it be its central backbone and give the tree height. And anything else that's going to be competing with it, you want to remove. What can happen is if you leave them in place and you get multiple leaders going on, you can get a wishbone effect where during a windstorm, one branch will want to go one way, the other branch will want to go other, and they'll just split apart. And that's not going to be a long-lived tree for the environment. So try to keep one leader in the tree. Select the lowest permanent branch that's coming off. This, in theory, would be the first branch you can grab and pull yourself up into the tree. There are rules in some areas on what that lowest permanent branch can be. If you have a tree on the street over the over the road, it's probably about 14 feet is what that permanent branch should be. Over sidewalks, it's somewhere around 9. In your backyard, it could be 2 feet because you don't have rules. Scaffold branches are going to be everything else that's coming off the central leader um, that's going to give the canopy shape. And you want to have them spaced up and down and around the tree and cut back things that are too close or that may be competing with other branches. And anything that might be below that lowest permanent branch, we call a temporary branch. 
yeah, it may not be the best branch, or it may not be in the right place, but it is producing leaves, and those leaves are producing sugars, and those sugars are helping the tree grow. So we'll just give it one more year before we remove it. So let's look at this scenario. We're going to look at tree A and then come back and look at tree B. Tree A was planted and ignored for its first 15 years of life. And if we look at it, we see it was installed in the ground with already bad architecture. We had all the branches clustered at one point and multiple leaders present. And as we just fast forward in time, we start to see how these branches are growing. We now have a branch growing back into the canopy which is going to cause some crossing and rubbing branches. We have too many branches at one point. We have no lowest permanent branch. And if we just jump ahead to 15 years, what we have is a tree not destined to be a long-lived, vigorous tree. We have all the branches at one point. We have very close branch unions. Um, we have crossing and rubbing branches. We have stubs coming off the side. We have suckers coming up. Um, if there was a heavy snow event, there would be a high probability of a branch breaking out. Um, there could be decay in this tree. And just, well, let's just look at it from aesthetically. Is it a pretty tree? Is this a tree you would want in your landscape? So let's look at B and the other extreme. This is a tree that at the time it was planted had a nice central leader and branches arranged up and down and around the trunk of the tree. And each year we're going to come out to it with our pruning tools and we're going to, one, remove broken disease, dying dead tissue. Get that out. We're then going to remove the anything that's competing with the central leader to maintain a central leader. We're going to define the lowest permanent branch and remove anything that will be competing with it. We're going to select scaffold branches that are going to go up and down and around the tree and make sure they're spaced out. And then we're going to start to remove the temporary branches below the lowest permanent branch. So every year, remove broken disease, dying dead. Examine the central leader, remove any competing leaders. Examine the lowest permanent branch, remove any competing permanent uh, branches. Continue to select scaffold branches for their branch angles and position going up and down and around the tree. And continue to remove temporary branches. Go out next year. Remove broken disease, dying dead. Check on the central leader. Remove competing leaders. Check on the lowest permanent branch. Remove competing branches. Continue to select scaffold branches for their branch angle and for their spacing and position along the trunk, both up and down and around, and continue to remove the temporary branches. Finally, when you get out to the point of 15 years later, you have a tree with a nice, strong central leader with an arrangement of scaffold branches that are evenly spaced up and down and around the tree and at the proper angle. And what we have now is a tree that aesthetically is much more appealing, but also one that is structurally strong and much more likely to survive a major snow or other storm event that we may encounter. And all we're doing is talking about going out into the garden in the late dormant season, spending 10 to 15 minutes with the tree each year. So just an example from my own front yard. Here is a swamp white oak that I planted in 2003. This is approximately 2004 when this picture was taken. And then following those guidelines every year, I'm out there working on that tree. Here it is in 2007. 2011. I'm now getting to the point where I need a longer pull saw in order to work on my central leader. So a little note on those scaffold branches. On our large shade trees we want them spaced about 12 inches apart. So as we look from one scaffold branch to the other we want about 12 inches between them at least. More would be better. We want them to radiate around the tree. So if we were to take an aerial view and look down they'd look like they're coming off like the spokes of a bicycle wheel. We want there to be a side ratio, a size ratio of roughly one to three. So this is the side branch, scaffold branch should be approximately one third the size of the trunk. Aesthetically, that's good. Structurally, that's really good. And no more than two at any one point. So having them uh, across from each other is great, but maybe they're at angles. Just try to keep two at any one point. Remove any extras. Again, this is especially important for shade trees. When we start to get to our smaller trees, 
our ornamentals, our smaller ornamentals and our fruit trees, these are some of the rules we can fudge. You may be able to have multiple leaders, but I still like to try to keep one, but maybe the scaffold branches, you can have more at any one point. The size ratio can be a little different. This, this is one of some of the wiggle room you got. So here's an example of some scaffold branches that need some work too many at one point, starting to get really tight angles in here. When they start getting that close together, um, that could be what we call included bark forming. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, here's really bad, too many at one point. I think I counted nine in here at one point in time. We got to watch those branch angles and we call them the V versus U. V is tight. And as you fast forward in time and these branches get thicker, this is just going to be trunk tissue on trunk tissue, trunk tissue. And this isn't a real connection. It actually becomes a weak point in, in the tree and is one of the places where failure can happen. We call that included bark when we get trunk on trunk from these really tight V shaped unions. And those are easy to prevent in the young stages of the tree, but very hard to correct in large mature trees. To do that, you've got to make the most difficult cut of your life, and that is finding that included bark, guessing where it becomes solid wood, and making a perpendicular cut to remove it. It's ugly. It's horrible. Again, it's so much easier when the tree is small, but if it's a branch the size of your wrist or larger, I wouldn't even touch it. What you want to look for are these nice wide branches, nice U-shaped ones. This is going to be aesthetically more eye-appealing and structurally stronger. These are what you want to promote. So here, on an elm tree, we're seeing both. Here's a V-shaped union, which will lead to included bark if left on. Very easily, we can remove it right there at the collar. On the other side of the tree, we have these nice wide, what we call the U-shaped ones, where they're coming off very perpendicular to the trunk. And these are going to be very strong and, and won't lead to included bark. We do have quite a few at this one point. I would thin it down to just one, but very good comparison on this is what we want to learn to identify and remove and these are what we want to try to promote and again this is included bark that on a tree that's getting to the point where I don't know if I would touch it but to do it properly we would follow this line down make a guess to where we think the wood actually begins and go perpendicular to that and it would look something like that when all said and done told you it's ugly So here's a combination of what started off as included bark leading with some uh, multiple leader problems and some wind stress. Um, we got a crack going down the tree. This, this is a hazard tree. This is going to be a tree that should be removed. And another great example of a bad tree. So just some examples here. Um, here's some before and afters. A uh, tree I'm going to go out. Uh, remove broken disease, dying dead. Boy, I really want to get that central leader, but uh, instead I got that stub and I worked on this lowest permanent branch. And with trees, I do try to stop at about 25% removal or one third. I don't want to remove too much. And um, I set my priorities to get these major branches out first because I always figured this, this branch, or a double leader, was small enough I can get it next year. So with this tree, you approach it, you look at it, and it's like, wow, it's a mess. There's no single leader. Um, where do you begin? Well, maybe you're not going to solve all the problems in one um, pruning cut. So maybe you're going to say, I want to make maybe three cuts on this tree and be done for the year. Come back the following year, see how it responded, and go again. So I'm going to say on this tree with so many leaders, I'm going to get it down to one, two, three liters. So I'm going to make a cut here, make another cut to remove that branch. I'm going to leave the center part of the tree. I've removed approximately a quarter to a third. I'm going to stop. Let this tree grow another year or two and come out and make another pruning decision, trying to get it down to one liter. Now here's a tree with a great central leader in place, but the scaffold branches are just all so tight together. Well, I could very easily start to thin those out. Boom, 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 boom and make a lot of space. Now the question is, what's going to be my lowest permanent branch? Is this guy my lowest permanent branch? Or is this little guy my lowest permanent branch? We'll just have to make those decisions as that tree grows. 
Now, I don't talk about fruit trees in here. Pruning fruit trees is a totally separate subject. But when we're looking for tall, straight, central leaders and shade trees, with most of our fruit trees, we're looking for some multiple leaders and some scaffolds very low to the ground so when fruit forms, it's easy to harvest. Um, so this is a great example on how you would start to get to pruning fruit trees. The thing that's wrong with this picture is that this is not a fruit tree. This is a linden tree, and it should be pruned like the rest of these in the back. Um, so, you know, my suggestion for correcting that one would be just a cut at the ground line. Move on. Now, with pruning evergreens, uh, for the most part, we can let evergreens grow and we just enjoy their natural shape. But then again, there are people who like to do Japanese gardening, and that requires a lot of torturous pruning on our evergreens that are a staple of those landscape designs. Also dwarf conifers and garden conifers, in order to stay small and in scale with your landscape, do require some pruning on them. But again, for the big ones, eh, their natural forms are usually pretty good. Now to prune evergreens, you really need to know the type you're pruning. Not everything's a pine, not everything's a spruce. You need to learn to tell the difference between spruce, fir, Douglas fir, pine, juniper. You need to know those differences. Today's not that class, but we'll cover that sometime in the future. Because they each have different growing requirements and they will respond to pruning very differently. So when we look at spruce, fir, and Douglas fir, they have a growth spurt in the spring and you could hard prune them in the dormant season. So when it's when they're not actively growing, you can cut, 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 cut. And you can then lightly prune them in the spring and early summer. And wherever you make a cut, they're going to form new buds. So if we look at this spruce, if we were to make our cut here, there's, they're going to form new buds that will take over growth. These are pretty easy to prune, to shear, to take care of. You can do, like I said, all sorts of torturous things to them. Pines get to be a little trickier. Pines have a single flush of growth that occurs each season, and we call that the candle. And they look just like candles coming up off of the tree. They're the uh, spurt of growth, and the needles are really tight on them. They haven't expanded yet. And to keep that plant from becoming overgrown, we want to come out to our pines when those candles have formed and cut off about two-thirds of the candle. So if the plant grows a six-inch candle, cut off four inches. That way there it's only grown two inches that year. That's really going to slow their growth. They're going to continue to grow. You're just slowing the growth quite a bit. Where you make that cut, new buds will form for next year and growth will continue. You can make a mistake by waiting too long and removing those candles when growth has, those needles have expanded, new buds will not form. Or by removing too much of the candle and getting back into old growth, new buds will not form either. And that becomes a dead end on the growth of that plant. And you can misshape it in, in the long run if you keep doing that too many times. Also keep in mind if you're trying to grow a conifer to be a large shade tree, keep your eyes open for double leaders. How easy would that be to correct at this stage? Just with a pair of clippers, you can just nip it off right there and have it corrected. Arborvitae, yews, hemlock, and junipers. They grow continuously through the season. You can shear them through the midsummer. But when you look at them, you got to get down into them. Because what you'll find is on older ones, you'll have a green outer shell where you can do all the cutting. But on the inside, you get a brown zone, a dead zone. And I will not promise that growth will come from that if you were to get down into it. So on this yew, you can cut everywhere where it's green, but when you get down into that brown spot and you expose one of those brown spots, I will not vouch whether it'll grow or not. Plant tissue can be juvenile and it can be mature, and juvenile tissue can spring back with no problem, but when it's matured, it may have trouble regrowing sprouts. So. Be cautious, and sometimes when you have an older landscape and many of these overgrown plants, it may be easier just to retire them from your landscape and replace them with something else. For example, my neighbors, they tried to get these into shape and wound up having to uh, rip these shrubs up after having three years of this in the landscape. 
Now your weapon of choice is a personal preference, but I'm going to tell you um, some guidelines here. First of all, a pair of hand pruners is, is pretty standard. Um, they come as two types. There is what we call bypass, in which there is a blade that bypasses the lip when you close the, the mechanism. And this makes a nice clean cut. This becomes your surgeon's tool for making good clean cuts. Opposed to this is what we call the anvil type, and this is where you have a flat surface and a blade that presses down onto the twig and crushes the tissue on the anvil to make the cut. And that's good for just chopping stuff up to throw away, but this is the, the anvil type is not your surgeon's tool. Get the bypass type. Hand pruners are good for small things up to maybe an inch in size for tissue. Um, beyond that, you may want to upgrade to what we call loppers. And again, they can come anvil or bypass type, type. But what's different with them is their handles. They, you will get a greater mechanical advantage and be able to cut larger pieces of tissue with these handles and a larger bite. These are limited, though, if you try to put them into a shrub and you don't have any room to open those handles up because of how dense the shrub is. That's where I want to move to a saw. And with a saw, I like a good pruning saw. I don't want to go to the garage and pull out a box saw or a bow saw. Um, those have other purposes. You actually want to get a good pruning saw. And some characteristics of a pruning saw will be first an ergonomic handle, so your wrist is in position to do all this work. You're going to have a tapered blade that's going to curve, and this is going to allow you to get into some tight spots that you will find while pruning. The teeth are going to be sharpened on both the front and the back, so you are cutting on both the push and the pull, so your work is um, the most efficient. You will find at the store blades that are very long and very wicked looking. You do not need one of those. What you want to do is find a saw that has a blade about 6, 8, maybe 10 inches at the most, and use that. That's going to cut through most everything you're going to need, especially if you're following that wrist rule. Don't cut things larger than your wrist. For care of these tools, I always like to make sure I get tools that have replacement blades because there's nothing worse than being in the middle of a job and all of a sudden your tools are dull. So either have backups or replacement blades you can put on. Um, I also recommend having some sort of disinfectant on hand. You can use a 10% bleach solution. I prefer Lysol, which is about a 70% ethyl alcohol. Um, I will spray that on my tools quite often, um, probably not as often as I should, but you should do it at least between going from plant A to plant B, if not more. Um, there's many diseases both uh, of fungus, bacteria, mycoplasms, virus that you can inadvertently spread in your garden if you don't disinfect the tools. Um, so disinfect your tools regularly. And again, use the, the uh, liquid form. Don't use the uh, disinfectant rags because those just won't get into the nooks and crannies on your tools.